Afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. It's nice to see you. Uh, before we get started, and just for the sake of uh, efficiency, I know that there's uh, at least one aspect of the President's news conference yesterday that attracted some attention. And uh, so I thought I might just sort of go over at least one aspect of that argument. Uh, and it's specifically this that, you know, the President stands squarely behind the decision that he made yesterday to wear his summer suit at yesterday's <laughs> news conference. It's the Thursday before Labor Day. He feels pretty good about it. So anyway, with that bit of frivolity out of the way, Nedra. So why aren't you wearing it? <laughs> I, I will say that I contemplated it. it. Seemed like it might be a little too much. So Nedra, do you want to get started with uh, some more serious questions today? Yes. Um, does the United States see a higher tariff threat here following the announcement by Britain today? Well, uh, Nedra, I can uh, uh, confirm that the British government has raised its domestic threat level from substantial to severe. Uh, senior White House officials and other national security officials in the administration uh, have been in touch with their British counterparts about this. Uh, I'd refer you to the British for the explanation uh, about why they have made this determination in terms of their own uh, terror threat level. Uh, I do understand that they have, uh, that generally speaking, that it's related to the threat posed by foreign fighters that are uh, that have Western passports, that have British passports, uh, that are fighting alongside ISIL uh, in Syria. Uh, this is a threat that the United States uh, has been focused on. We've been coordinating closely with our allies, uh, both the Brits but others in Europe, uh, about countering this threat uh, and mitigating it. Uh, we've been doing that by cooperating through law enforcement channels, through national security channels, but also through uh, intelligence channels as well. Uh, as it relates to the United States National Terror Alert System, uh, I don't anticipate at this point that there are uh, that there's a plan to change uh, that level, uh, but those are official announcements that are made by the Department of Homeland Security. So I'd refer you to them for uh, an official determination on that. But it's my understanding right now uh, that there are no plans to change it. Does this administration believe that the Islamic State militants currently pose a threat to Americans here in the United States? Well, the concern, uh, Nedra, that we have articulated is not dissimilar from the threat that the British uh, have identified and acted on. Uh, today. Uh, for a number of months now, we have been monitoring those individuals that have Western passports, that are citizens of Western countries, either the United States uh, or, or in Europe, who have made the decision to travel to Syria or that broader region, taken up arms alongside ISIL. Uh, they pose a threat because they are, they've received military training, they are now battle-hardened, and they've demonstrated a willingness to risk their lives for their cause. Uh, those individuals, as I mentioned, have Western passports, uh, and that does give them uh, some freedom of movement uh, that could allow them to come back to uh, the West uh, and carry out acts of violence. Uh, that is why the United States, in conjunction with our partners, uh, so these are other allied countries of ours, uh, have been monitoring the situation, have been tracking, uh, or at least monitoring the movements of these individuals. Uh, you know, Interpol uh, is involved in this effort. Uh, there are also countries in the region that have been supportive of, of uh, the efforts of the United States and our allies to, to monitor the situation. Uh, the United States is always uh, making adjustments to counterterrorism measures. Uh, you know, some of those measures are seen and some of those are unseen. Uh, we talk about this typically when it comes to aviation security. Uh, but it is true uh, as it relates to you know, other aspects of our nation's homeland security system. So this is a threat that we are monitoring. It's one that we have been focused on for quite some time. Uh, it has been the focus of intensive discussions inside the administration. It's also been the focus of intensive discussions uh, with governments uh, in the region and around the world. Can you explain why the President changed his travel plans today to come back to the White House tonight? Is it, does it have anything to do with this tariff threat? Uh, it, it is not specifically related to uh, any sort of se uh, assessment or change in the terror threat that's currently uh, emanating from uh, that region of the world. Uh, merely, this is an opportunity for the President, when he saw his schedule, uh, decided that he'd rather just make the late evening flight back here home to the White House. He could sleep in his own bed, uh, do a little work tomorrow, spend some time with his family, and then travel uh, back, to, uh, back to New York tomorrow evening to attend a private event. When you say do a little work, is he planning to meet with advisors on any of these um, current pressing world problems? Uh, I don't know uh, at this point of any specific meetings, uh, but if there are meetings that take place that we can tell you about, then we'll let you know. 
Okay. Steve. Did the president yesterday mean to signal that he's nowhere near a decision on airstrikes in Syria and in fact is, is not convinced that it's a good thing to do? I think the president was pretty explicit that he is determined to make sure that every element of his national security strategy uh, is thought through. Uh, the strategy that he's laid out is multifaceted. Uh, it includes a lot of important diplomatic work, uh, both with the Iraqi government but also with governments in the region. Uh, it includes some military work, separate from active kinetic strikes, uh, but military work that's focused on offering support to the Kurdish uh, and Iraqi security forces. There's a lot of, uh, there's an important military to military relationship there, uh, and one that we're going to continue to cultivate. Uh, but military action uh, by the United States is also a part of this, uh, uh, is, is also an important component of this strategy. The President has authorized military action uh, in, Syria, in Iraq, uh, and there, those uh, military actions have produced some positive results. Just in the last few weeks, uh, because of American military action, uh, we averted a humanitarian disaster at Mount Sinjar. Uh, because of military action in support of Kurdish and Iraqi security forces, uh, we were able to blunt the rapid advance on Erbil. That's important because there's an American consulate in Erbil uh, and American citizens, American personnel, uh, who are working in Erbil uh, on a range of functions, including closely coordinating with Iraqi and Kurdish security forces. Uh, there was also important work that was done by the United States military to conduct strikes in support of Iraqi and Kurdish security forces to retake the Mosul Dam. That's a piece of critical infrastructure in Iraq. So we've already demonstrated, and the President's already demonstrated, A, a willingness to order military action and strikes uh, in Iraq. Uh, those were part of a thought-through strategy uh, in terms of trying to safeguard uh, American citizens who are in uh, Iraq. Uh, and the President is wants to be similarly rigorous as we think through other aspects of our strategy that could include military action. There are some who have called for uh, the President to take action uh, or order military action uh, in Syria. Uh, the, the Pentagon uh, is developing plans uh, or military options for the President to consider uh, if he decides that it's necessary to do so. Uh, but at this point, the President hasn't made any decisions and hasn't ordered any military action uh, in Syria. But uh, if he does take that step, it will be one that is carefully considered, uh, one that is deliberately arrived at, uh, and one that will uh, be made in close consultation with the United States Congress. And what sort of time frame are you looking at in the decision-making process? Well, I wouldn't speculate about, about, about time frame at this point. Uh, the, uh, the President has been deliberate about this process. He'll continue to be. And I think that was evident from his answer on this question yesterday. And lastly, on the immigration order question, um, is there, are you thinking about delaying it for a little while because you don't want to impact the discussions over the CR that could trigger a budget shutdown, a government shutdown? Well, at this point, Steve, I don't have an update in terms of timing. Uh, you did hear from the President yesterday where he uh, reiterated his strong commitment uh, to take action within the scope of his authority. Uh, to solve or at least address so many of the problems that, have been, that are created by our broken immigration system. Uh, this, there is legislation that has passed through the Senate, as we know, that would have addressed so many of these problems in a way that would have had substantial benefits for our economy. Unfortunately, we've seen Republicans in the House engage in a political strategy to block that piece of legislation from even coming up for a vote. Uh, the President is disappointed that House Republicans have pursued that political strategy, and that's why the President has resolved to use as much authority as he can muster within the confines of the law to try to solve this problem on his own. Uh, he does that uh, hoping that House Republicans will come to their senses at some point uh, and pass a piece of legislation that would be even more impactful in terms of solving those problems and would supersede uh, any sort of executive action that he might take. Uh, but the President is determined as ever uh, to take uh, that kind of action on his own simply because House Republicans uh, have blocked the ability of Congress to try to solve this problem. Okay? Jim. Josh. Uh, getting back to uh, that comment, we don't have a strategy yet. Uh, we know that the President uh, was talking about uh, a strategy for ISIS in Syria, but, but having said that, uh, would he like to have that one back? Well, Jim, I, I want to clarify one thing, what, what you described. 
the, the president was talking specifically about military options for countering ISIS uh, in Syria. There are a number of things that we've already done uh, to, as it relates to the broader situation in Syria, uh, to confront some of the challenges there. Uh, the United States, as we've discussed many times in this room, is the largest single donor of humanitarian aid uh, to uh, Syria in terms of dealing with the uh, terrible humanitarian situation that has been caused by the violence in Syria. Uh, we've seen significant numbers, millions of people who have been displaced, displaced by the violence there. Uh, the United States has been engaged in an effort to uh, support the moderate Syrian opposition. Uh, there are a range of ways in which that support is provided. Uh, there's also some diplomatic support that's been provided to them. So uh, there already has been some work underway in Syria uh, to try to uh, address some of the challenges there. Uh, but the President was candid about the fact that the Pentagon and is still uh, reviewing options that may be available to him, uh, military options that may be available to him, to counter ISIL militarily in Syria. But when you're the President, words matter. And just getting back to that first question, does he, does he wish he had articulated that, uh, that sentiment differently? Well, Jim, I, he was asked a very specific question. Uh, and he was asked a question about – right? I mean, well, he was – but let me, let me finish this. This is important. He was asked a very specific question about whether or not the President would seek a congressional authorization before ordering any sort of military, uh, military action in Syria. And the point the President made was that that's, that's putting the cart before the horse. The President hasn't yet laid out a specific plan for military action in Syria. Uh, and the reason for that is simply that the Pentagon is still developing that plan. Uh, and he's still reviewing them. And it would be putting the cart before the horse to, to talk about what sort of congressional authorization would be required for a plan that hasn't even been put in place yet. I don't mean to belabor it, but the fact that you came out so quickly and, and, and tried to explain what the President had to say suggests that, uh, that what he said was, was not what he intended to say. Or are you saying that just the rest of us took it the wrong way? Well, I, I think I think what you know I would what I mean? yeah, I do know what you mean. I, the reaction that uh, we had at the White House yesterday was not in response to the President's comments. Uh, it's in response to the way it was being reported. And I don't mean that to sound as a, as a criticism of you all doing your jobs. You all have an important job to do. Uh, but we do believe that it's important for people, both you and your readers and viewers, uh, to understand what message the President was trying to communicate uh, and what strategy uh, he has already laid out for confronting ISIL and what decisions remain to be made uh, as it relates to military options that are available to him in Syria. So again, that is not a critique of the media, it's just an observation that we didn't listen to the President's news conference and go formulate a strategy for uh, responding. Uh, we listened to the President's news conference, watched your reporting, uh, and recognized that uh, if we wanted uh, people to have a very clear understanding uh, of what the President was trying to communicate, that we needed to engage you directly to do that. And that's what we tried to do. And, and getting back to uh, Prime Minister Cameron's uh, comments, uh, he, he said that this is not some foreign conflict thousands of, of miles from home. He, he, he seemed to take a tougher tone uh, with respect to ISIS than the President did yesterday. And, and a lot of people observed that the President's comments yesterday were not really in line or in sync with uh, the urgency expressed by uh, Secretary Hagel, uh, Joint Chiefs Chairman Dempsey, who described it as uh, you know, it's beyond anything we've ever seen, uh, talking about ISIS in Syria, that you can't really take care of the ISIS problem without dealing with Syria. What do you make of that? Is the President on the same page as his, as his cabinet when it comes to dealing with well, ISIS? Well, I think the more important observation, Jim, is that the cabinet is on the same page as the Commander-in-Chief. Uh, and I am fully confident that that's the case. There's no debate inside the situation well, when it comes to striking ISIS immediately in Syria. I don't think debate is the way that I would describe it. I mean, I'm not going to get it, be in a position of re de providing a detailed readout of a, of a private meeting between the President and his National Security Council. But you, you've, been, you've had the opportunity now to observe the President's leadership style, uh, and you recognize that the President is interested in hearing the unvarnished assessment uh, of his senior advisors. That's true when he's talking to uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the Secretary of Defense about our military strategy. Uh, it's also true when he's talking to his press secretary about our political strategy or our communication strategy. So uh, the President is interested in eliciting the unvarnished opinion of everybody that's sitting around the table. 
Uh, and it wouldn't be particularly helpful to the President of the United States if everybody sitting around the table had exactly the same opinion or exactly the same perspective on this challenge. So, so the, the President, as to again, I'm not reading out the meeting, but I am in a position to, to, to convey to you that the President is, uh, is determined to get the unvarnished uh, assessment uh, of, the, uh, of the professionals who sit around the table make, with him uh, as he makes important decisions. But I, I have no doubt, and if you, if you do, then you should go ask each one of them about whether or not they're on the same page as the Commander in Chief. I am confident that they are. Okay? Let's move around a little bit. Justin. Um, I wanted to look back to your answer on immigration a little bit. You said that there was no update on timing. And so I just wanted to read back to you that back earlier this month, you said that uh, you expected the review to end of the end of summer and that you anticipated that the President would act on those recommendations shortly after receiving them. The President also said that he intended to adopt the recommendations without further delay, both of which would indicate that you're going to get these recommendations before the end of summer and act on them before the midterm elections. And so my question to you is, is that still what we should be operating under? Well, I, I don't, you know, the President got asked a, a specific question about immigration yesterday. And about timing. Well, I, I think what he did answer uh, was, uh, if you'll allow me to uh, offer up my own view on this, he answered the most important part of that question, which is, does the pre is the President still committed uh, to taking action where House Republicans uh, won't? Uh, and the President is as determined as ever to make sure that he is going to use all of the elements of his authority within the confines of the law uh, to try to address some of the problems that have been created by our broken immigration system. There's an easy solution sitting on Capitol Hill that's already passed the Senate with bipartisan support. It has strong bipartisan support all across the country, uh, but House Republicans are blocking it right now. The President is disappointed uh, that Republicans have chosen to pursue that strategy that may, uh, in the minds of some Republican political strategists, be in their best uh, partisan political interests, but it's certainly not in the best interest of the country. And that's why the President's determined to take uh, the kinds of steps that are, that are available to him uh, to try to address uh, this challenge. Now, a secondary legitimate question is, what's the time frame for that? Uh, and I just don't have any additional information to share with you about what that time frame is. Well, so, I mean, the reason that I asked the Los Angeles Times reported today, mm -hmm. quoting a senior administration official, that you guys are considering splitting up the recommendations so that you'd implement things that are more palatable to uh, both Republicans and, and Democrats running in vulnerable races to roll out before midterm elections and then push off some of the broader sweeping things that we've certainly heard the interest groups that are coming in here discuss until after the midterm elections. So I'm wondering if you can talk at all about whether that's something that you're considering or whether you expect, you know, when the President comes out and talks about immigration that we're going to hear him fully lay out everything that he plans to do. Well, I, I guess I'd say it this way, to borrow a phrase that was used in a different context yesterday, that's putting the cart before the horse. Uh, the President hasn't actually received the final recommendations from his Attorney General and the Secretary of Homeland Security for what, uh, what options are available to him uh, for acting unilaterally to address some of the problems of our broken mm -hmm. immigration system. So those who are speculating about how those recommendations might be implemented are, are, are a little uh, ahead of themselves in this point. Well, the concerns being uh, sort of spoken about by Senate Democrats who are in running in vulnerable race who's going to play into your guys' decision when you make a choice about when or if or how to implement these immigration? Well, Justin, what we have seen, as I mentioned earlier, is a, uh, is a conclusion that has been reached by House Republicans that is in their political interest to do something that's not in the nation's interest, uh, and that is to pass comprehensive, common sense, bipartisan immigration reform legislation. Uh, that's unfortunate. It's House Republicans who are making politically motivated decisions right now. Uh, the President is focused on trying to solve problems. And what the President would like to do uh, is to have a legitimate, fact-based debate uh, about this current condition uh, of our immigration system. There are problems in our immigration system. That may be the one thing that is widely agreed upon uh, among both Democrats and Republicans, that our immigration system is broken. Uh, there's only, right now, there's only one side that seems determined to try to fix it. And the President, in the context of using his own authority to try to fix that problem, uh, wants to have uh, a debate uh, about the status of our immigration system, what the consequences are for allowing that broken immigration system to persist, uh, and what Republicans uh, have done, or in this case not done, uh, to try to confront that problem. So uh, all of th that broader debate is uh, an important part of the context uh, in which the President wants to act. 
Uh, and uh, well, yeah, sorry to belabor the point. It's okay. This is my last one on this, but if the president is genuinely only concerned about solving or addressing the issue, and then we're hearing reports that the president might, for political reasons, delay implementing some of these uh, recommendations that are going to come to his to his desk. Don't those seem contradictory in some way? Wouldn't the president want to immediately implement all steps that he thinks or is told could help resolve this issue? Well, I, I think there may be some people who are speculating that the president is uh, is making a political decision as it relates to immigration. I would put forward probably a non-controversial suggestion that those are probably people who are regular critics of the president. So I, I take that, uh, that uh, declaration with a grain of salt. What the president wants to do is he wants to solve problems. He also wants to do that in the context of a debate that's well understood by the American public. Uh, and the context of that debate is, uh, a, is a, an unvarnished uh, assessment of the current state of our immigration system. Uh, he wants to make sure that the American public understands what the consequences are for uh, our broken immigration system to persist without solving it. Uh, and the president wants to make sure that the context of that debate is understood uh, in, uh, in that there is a reasonable, common sense proposal that's already been passed by bar bipartisan fashion through the Senate and would pass the House uh, if House Republicans weren't blocking it. Okay? Ishan. Thank you, Josh. What message could Secretary Kerry convey to the Gulf countries that he hasn't conveyed before? And what makes the president now confident? that the Sunni neighbors of Iraq and Syria would behave differently, knowing that they contributed to the creation of extremists like ISIS and others through funneling money and arms to, to Syria for a long time. Isham, I think the President uh, alluded to this a little bit yesterday when he was talking about this subject. It is, it is very clearly uh, in the interests of Iraq's and Syria's neighbors, uh, even those Sunni countries to not have a violent extremist organization wreaking havoc in their neighborhood. It's destabilizing, uh, and it poses a, a pretty direct threat uh, to those countries. So it is in their interest, as never before, for them to work in partnership with other countries in the region and even other interested countries around the world like the United States to counter that threat uh, and to mitigate the destabilizing impact uh, of those violent activities that we've seen uh, perpetrated by ISIL. Uh, that will be part of the, of the message and that will be the topic of discussion that uh, the Secretary of State will carry with him when he goes to the region. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that they'll, at least w one way or another, the State Department officials who are traveling with the Secretary will read out those meetings. So I wouldn't want to get ahead of uh, what those discussions look like, but uh, it is clear that the backdrop for those conversations uh, is that the clear interest of these governments uh, has, in the last several weeks, been crystallized. I'd like to clarify something you answered earlier on. Does the President agree with uh, Prime Minister Cameron, or is he willing to go as far as Prime Minister Cameron, saying that the establishment of an Islamic State in Iraq constitutes a direct national threat to the United States? Well, I didn't see all of Prime Minister Cameron's remarks. Uh, what I, the, the aspect of his remarks that I did see uh, was the explanation put forward by his government about why they decided to change their, uh, their terror threat level. Uh, and that specifically, specifically was related to the threat that uh, is posed by uh, individuals with Western passports that have been fighting alongside ISIL uh, that could, uh, using their passports, travel back to the West and carry out acts of violence in the West. And so I know that there are a number of security uh, changes or changes in their nation's security posture that they have put in place. Uh, the United States is regularly uh, monitoring our security posture. We're also working very closely with our allies, both at a law enforcement level as well as a national security level, uh, to try to mitigate this threat. It's something that we've been engaged in for quite some time, and those efforts continue to this day, even this hour. Okay. Mike. Um, a question on the Ukraine. The British government, who I guess is being the hawks today, um, is pressing European allies to block Russia from the SWIFT bank network, which is an important financial network. Um, that would be a significant escalation in the financial sanctions against Russia over Ukraine. Does the U.S. government share the British government's view on this? Are you also trying to do something like that to block them from the SWIFT network? And 
damage their um, financial relations? I, I haven't seen uh, those reports. Mike, I'd refer you to the Treasury Department, who can talk about what sort of financial tools are available to the United States and our allies as we consider uh, efforts to impose additional economic costs on Russia for their actions in Ukraine. Broadly speaking, though, are you looking to step up the financial sanctions at the moment, uh, take, take them to another level when it concerns the financial sector? Well, as, speaking as a general matter, based on Russia's continued conduct in Ukraine, uh, based on their uh, continued effort to escalate that situation militarily, we have seen you know, the continued movement of equipment and materiel uh, across the border from Russia into Ukraine. We've even seen pretty uh, definitive reports uh, that Russian troops have moved across the border and are now firing on Ukrainian military positions. So we have seen uh, Russia interfere in Ukraine in ways that the international community uh, is completely unwilling to tolerate. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, it does put Russia at risk uh, of facing uh, additional economic costs that can be imposed uh, by the United States in concert uh, with our allies. But putting aside the specific tactic I mentioned, would you expect to see further steps from the United States to isolate Russia in the financial sector? Well, Mike, as you know, the President is traveling to, uh, to Europe next week. Uh, he'll have the opportunity to meet with a number of our NATO allies. Uh, and the situation in Ukraine is a prominent item on the agenda. Uh, and I'm confident that there will be uh, serious discussions uh, about imposing uh, additional economic costs on Russia. Okay. Major. Josh, in Ukraine, is it an invasion and do the Russians commit an act of war? Well, what we have seen from the Russians is consistent with the kind of behavior that we've seen with, from them for many months now. Uh, we have seen there's, we, there's all ample intelligence, uh, social media reporting. Uh, to indicate that the they're the actively NATO Secretary General now call it Russian regulars in Ukraine with military equipment. Is that an invasion? Is it an act of war? Well, the evidence that has been presented by NATO is compelling. Uh, and it does indicate that Russia is continuing to do the kinds of things, using their military might, to further destabilize the situation in Ukraine. What we have asked the, called on the Russians to do is to actually use their influence in Ukraine to try to de-escalate the situation there. And it's clear that they're, they're not doing that right now. But doesn't in the language matter in this case? Is there something that is you are reluctant to use those words to describe what appears to be happening in front of everyone's eyes in Ukraine? I think we've been very clear about describing what exactly has happened there. The President did when he was asked this question yesterday, and we have been for many months. Uh, as the Russian military has allowed weapons and material to be transferred across the border, uh, as the Russian military has fired on Ukrainian military positions, uh, as the uh, Russian military has even uh, put boots on the ground in Ukraine, uh, we have regularly marshaled evidence to indicate uh, what exactly is happening, despite the protestations uh, of the Russian government that, for some reason, would have us all believe otherwise. Uh, the fact is, those denials are completely um, without any credibility. And uh, we, you know, we've been pretty candid about that, I think. You mentioned earlier that uh, the United States government is monitoring the movements of these individuals, meaning Americans who have gone into Syria to fight on behalf of ISIS or ISIL. Mm -hmm. Does the decision so far not to increase the threat level here indicate that there is a higher degree of confidence within the United States intelligence community to monitor these people in a way that the British do not currently share? Well, I, um, I, I don't want to be in a position of assessing sort of the competence or success of an ongoing intelligence uh, I'm not operation. I'm trying to describe competence. Okay. I'm trying to get a question of confidence, which are two separate things. They are. The ability to monitor and have visibility of, do we feel confident of our ability to monitor and have high levels of confidence about our ability to track these Americans in ways that possibly the British government does not? Well, again, that, that is an assessment of our, of our intelligence capabilities that I don't want to venture from here. But let me, let me say this. The, the United States, on our own right now, uh, is dedicating significant resources and time and attention uh, to uh, mitigating this threat. Uh, we are also, in addition to that, working very closely with other interested parties, including the British, uh, to try to counter this threat, to monitor these individuals and mitigate the, the, the threat of violence that they uh, may pose to uh, Western interests. Uh, and that is something that continues. We're working very closely with the, with the British on this. 
I mean, one thing that has been observed publicly, that I would observe publicly from here, uh, I think, is that the you know, part of the British concern is that there is, according to published reports, uh, a relatively large number uh, of individuals with British passports who have gone uh, to the region to fight alongside uh, ISIL. Uh, the published reports, uh, as they relate to the number of Americans who are there, uh, is somewhat lower. Okay. Um, the President, in addition to saying there was no strategy in Syria, said we can rout ISIL militarily. He said that this was a direct quote from the President near the end of the press conference yesterday. First of all, how does he know that? And is that the goal, ultimately, of U.S. policy? I mean, if we don't have a strategy to get them in Syria, which is their base of operations, might be their aspirational capital of their caliphate, how does he know we can route them militarily? Well, I'll, uh, I'll say a couple of things about that. One of the things that uh, the President said in the now famous statement is the word yet was at the end. So the Department of Defense uh, is hard at work uh, on developing some military options for the President in Syria. Now, whether the President uh, chooses to uh, take advantage of one of those options, whether the President orders one of those options, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but these are plans that are being developed. The President does have a lot of confidence in his uh, in the military apparatus to develop uh, some solid plans for him. Uh, but I any sort of strike or military action that he orders will be a, uh, if ordered, will be a component of a broader strategy for defeating ISIL uh, and mitigating the threat that they pose uh, to the United States uh, and to Western interests. Uh, and that will all be done uh, w you know, with, uh, with our partners, uh, both in the Iraqi government uh, and the governments in the region, uh, and with countries around the world. This will be a joint effort. Now, let me say one other thing about what you said, because it's important. The question in the mind of the President uh, is more complicated, and in some ways even bigger, than does the United States, in conjunction with our allies, have the capability to rout, as he described it, ISIL? The real question is, how do we sustainably secure the situation in Iraq so that even if ISIL is routed, that they can't sprout back up and, and make significant gains in Iraq, or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, and that is why the strategy that the President has put forward has at the top of that list a unified, successful, sophisticated, integrated Iraqi government that can unite that country to face the threat that's posed by ISIL uh, and to ensure that the Iraqi people can take, res their, take responsibility themselves for the security situation in their country. That ultimately is how we will be in a position to deny ISIL the ability to create a safe haven where they could, uh, you know, where they could threaten uh, other countries in the region or eventually even other countries around the world. I understand that and I appreciate you for saying that. Is there any risk, Josh, for this president to see complexity and it become an excuse for paralysis because people who look at this region say, if you solve this militarily, then a lot of these other issues can be addressed, but you can't address these other issues if ISIS presents an ongoing, expanding terroristic and military threat to ever larger pockets of space in Iraq and Syria. I mean, just this week, they took four runs at an air base each and every one of them more tactically and operationally sophisticated than the one before it, and the fourth one was successful. They have shown a penchant to adapt on the battlefield, use ever more sophisticated techniques, and gain space they believe are important to their overall territorial objectives. I mean, there would be those who would say, yes, there are all these other complex issues, but the military issue is before you now, and right. you better deal with it, or else you can't get to the rest of these things. Well, that's why the President has uh, been pretty clear about the idea that these things need to move together, right? And that's why the President, as the Iraqis have made progress uh, in forming the kind of inclusive government that we've called on them uh, to adopt for an, any number of months now, uh, has moved side by side with the President's plan to authorize military action in Iraq, right? I mentioned earlier that there are a number of things that have been accomplished by the Iraqi security forces with the important support of the U.S. military. But even so, the President said yesterday those bombing raids will be limited and 
pose little risk of exposure to U.S. forces. Right. I but mean, it's still a minor league effort. But they've been, I don't think I would describe it that way. They've been, they've been successful in supporting Iraqi and Kurdish security forces as they retook the Mosul Dam. Uh, they've been supportive and successful in blunting the offensive that was underway uh, against Erbil. Uh, again, that would not have been possible without uh, the American military intervention there. But the President is also determined, and the President said this not in yesterday's appearance in the briefing room, but in his previous appearance in the briefing room, uh, that he's the Commander in Chief of the United States military. Uh, and he will use that in support of Iraq's security forces to accomplish some of these goals. But the President is not going to become the Commander in Chief of the Iraqi Air Force. Uh, that ultimately we need to have a situation where the Iraqi people and the Iraqi government and Iraq security forces can take responsibility for their own security. And the United States and this president is willing to devote significant resources to assist and support uh, Iraq's government and Iraq's people uh, as they take that responsibility. But we can't do it for them, and the president's not going to try. Last question on this. So absent that coalition and complex array of other issues, ISIL can stay. Well, I, I guess I don't know what you mean. If it takes the Iraqis to do this, if we're not going to be the Iraqi Air Force and the other partners in the region don't come in in ways that they're currently not coming in, ISIL gets to stay. I mean, what is the well, lead dynamic here? Is it defeating them the lead dynamic or dealing with all these other things that make the complex over time more livable? Well, I, I, making sh the, the overriding dynamic here uh, is making sure that the, Amer the national security interests of the United States of America are protected. Uh, that is always the, at the top of the President's agenda. Now. Is that consistent with ISIL existing or not? What, what it's consistent with, that strategy, uh, requires the Iraqi government to do the right kinds of things that will unite that country to face down this threat. The good news is they're making those kinds of steps. When I was speaking before you three weeks ago, uh, Prime Minister Maliki uh, was still Prime Minister Maliki. Uh, he, uh, he isn't anymore. He's stepped aside. And Iraq does seem to be, Iraq's political leaders does seem, do seem to be pursuing the kind of in inclusive governing agenda that we'd like to see them uh, pursue. Now, they've got more work to do. They still have to form a cabinet, but that work is, is underway. Uh, we saw that Iraq's security forces and the Kurdish security forces were being overrun by ISIL forces. But thanks to the intervention of uh, the United States military and the bravery and courage and service of American servicemen and women, uh, they've been able to turn the tide in support of Iraq uh, security forces. Uh, never before, and I mentioned this earlier, never before has it been so clearly in the interests of regional governments to uh, combat uh, this violent extremist organization that's wreaking havoc in their neighborhood. That's not in their interest. So we're optimistic about the success that we may have uh, in rallying them to this cause as well. So, you know, th these, we've made important progress on this over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, but make no mistake, the President does not believe that just pers pursuing a military strategy uh, is a substitute for the more comprehensive strategy that will be required to arrive at an enduring solution to this problem. Jim? In light of the uh, British uh, raise of the terror threat there, and this being the Labor Day weekend with a lot of Americans traveling, simple question, and we're monitoring these Americans and Westerners with passports. Is there any evidence from the TSA, <coughs> from the FBI, CIA, NSA, any of our resources, that any of those people with the Western passports have been on planes or on the way back to the United States or already in the United States? Well, Jim, the most detailed uh, intelligence assessment that I can offer from here uh, is that there is no evidence or indication right now uh, that ISIL is actively plotting uh, to attack the United States homeland. Uh, that's true right now. Uh, that said, uh, it is important that we take the steps that are necessary uh, and as a part of the President's comprehensive strategy to deny them a safe haven that would give them the kind of comfort that they would need to consider plotting those kinds of attacks. Uh, we also need to be very vigilant uh, about the threat that is posed by foreign fighters, individuals with Western passports that have been fighting alongside ISIL that may be considering returning to the West to carry out some acts of violence here, too. So we're vigilant uh, about those things. Uh, and uh, that, is, that is work that often takes place behind the scenes, uh, that as we calibrate our security posture uh, and have the kinds of discussions about intelligence and national security matters that are important to the safety of the United States of America. Those things aren't often uh, evident to the American people, but people can have some confidence that the administration uh, and our national security professionals and our law enforcement professionals uh, are very vigilant uh, about the threat that we face in this regard. If we are, in fact, monitoring, as you said, do we, are we confident that we know 
all of the Americans that have gone to Syria to fight it next to ISIL? And do we, are we confident that we know that they're still there and not here, back here? Well, I, I can't offer an, a, an assessment about the depth of our uh, intelligence uh, Matt, uh, as, uh, as it relates to this specific question. Uh, I can tell you that this is, a, uh, this is a challenge that our national security apparatus and our intelligence apparatus uh, is very focused on. And it's why we're working so closely uh, with our partners and allies around the globe uh, to mitigate this threat. On the other subject of immigration, if I could for a moment, uh, in June there were 354 unaccompanied minors coming across daily uh, across the border in the United States from Central America. In, uh, in the latest figures that are for August that come out, it's down to, um, it's down to 104 a day. Uh, is, the, is the crisis among un uh, unaccompanied minors over on the border right now? Uh, for now. But what we have seen, Jim, is that, this, that these numbers are very volatile uh, and that there are important steps that this administration is, is taking to try to prevent those numbers from going back up. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't gotten the kind of support uh, in the form of resources that are necessary from the United States Congress. Uh, the President put forward a very detailed proposal for the kinds of resources that he would like to see uh, that could be used to try to prevent those numbers from increasing again. So, um, you know, there is, there, this is a problem that while the numbers have improved, uh, and we're certainly pleased about that, uh, this is a problem that we still uh, remain very focused on uh, because uh, we have, this has been a very volatile situation. Those numbers have, uh, without a lot of warning, on some occasions, spiked. Uh, and so we, we're going to continue our diplomatic efforts to work with the home countries uh, of these individuals where we're seeing this population uh, moving toward the southwest border to make sure they understand that they shouldn't try to make this dangerous journey. Uh, we're still going to be focused on shifting resources from the interior to the border to make sure that we can uh, continue our efforts to secure the border. Uh, the President is still uh, using his own executive authority uh, to devote additional resources to the immigration courts so we can make sure we can both uh, respect the, the, the due process uh, to which these individuals are entitled, uh, while at the same time we're making the wheels of justice turn efficiently. Justice, on, on those measures that you're talking about right now that you think have, have been successful to a point as of now. Right. I was just well, let me say one other thing about that, which is, I mean, the other factor here is the weather. Uh, that traditionally we have seen a decline in the numbers when the weather gets hotter. So I don't want to leave with the impression that it's only because of what the administration has done that we've seen these numbers go down. There are a variety of factors, but there's no doubt uh, that the administration has made a substantial contribution to the uh, reduction in those numbers. And as far as the measures, if I can finish that question. Yes, I apologize. It's okay. The, I was just in Guatemala, and, and as recently as last week, the Guatemalans continue to allow rafts to go across the Mexican border with unaccompanied minors, uninhibited by police. You say they have cooperation. Why aren't they stopping that? A, I just finished talking to the immigration judges, to the president of their union, who says the money that has been promised by the administration has not yet shown up. And they still have huge delays, uh, huge delays in, in the court system. What if, if that's not happening, if those two things aren't happening, what is working? What, what, what have you done that is actually stopping or at least reducing the numbers? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do think that, that the first place to start here is the numbers do speak for themselves, uh, that we've seen these numbers uh, dramatically lower for a variety of reasons. Uh, but it is clear that some of the steps that the, that the administration has put in place uh, have had an effect. Uh, as it relates to uh, the government of Guatemala, there clearly is more work that needs to be done. Uh, to uh, ensure that they're playing uh, as constructive a role as possible uh, in stemming the flow uh, of children or adults who are traveling with children uh, to the southwest border. Uh, what I would say is we have seen some important announcements over the last couple of months from the Mexican government and that they have been uh, playing an important role in uh, preventing uh, and tightening their, in tightening their borders in a way that is, frankly, uh, clearly in the interests of of the Mexican government and Mexican people and their own national security, but it has an attendant benefit for the United States, and uh, that's why we closely coordinate with them uh, on these issues. Uh, as it relates to resources for our immigration court system, uh, there's no doubt that we'd like to see additional resources being deployed to reduce that backlog. That's why the President specifically asked for uh, money from Congress to ensure that our courts could have the resources that they need to administer justice. Uh, and, you know, 
House Republicans have we engaged in a pretty coordinated effort uh, to prevent those resources from being provided. So, uh, you know, that's why the administration has had to resort to reprogram some funds uh, to try to dedicate to this effort. Uh, but there certainly is more that can be done and more that would be done uh, if Congress and Republicans in Congress weren't blocking it. Okay. Stephen? What was the calculation that went into the President's comments yesterday on Russia? They seemed, um, although you say they were explicit, they were much less impassioned than what Samantha Power had to say at the UN. Is, is there some attempt to try and stop the clash over Ukraine becoming a direct U.S.-Russia confrontation? Or, or are there things that a UN ambassador can say that the President can't without sort of elevating direct tensions with Putin? Well, I mean, Stephen, the, the, I think the President's answer uh, made clear a couple of things. The first is the President did draw a distinction between uh, the United States' uh, relationship with our NATO allies uh, and the Article 5 commitments that we have to those allies, uh, and how that is different than the kind of commitment that the United States has to a nation like Ukraine that, while is a, uh, a friend of the United States, uh, is not a NATO ally of the United States. Uh, however, uh, because the United States uh, does have an important relationship with Ukraine, uh, the United States will, as the President said, stand shoulder to shoulder with the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government uh, as they counter these destabilizing activities from the Russians. Um, but, you know, the President felt it was important uh, as a matter of policy uh, and as a matter of uh, giving the American people some insight into his thinking uh, to, uh, to clarify that we're not trending toward a military conflict between the United States and Russia in this region over this issue. Uh, there's a lot that we can do to support the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian people. There's a lot that we can do in acting in concert with our allies to impose costs on Russia for the, for the tactics that they're uh, employing right now. Uh, but people should also have a, a pretty clear understanding where the President's head is on this, and I think that that's what he was trying to lay out last night. Does the, does the administration think that Russia appreciates that distinction between U.S. attitudes towards Ukraine and U.S. US you know, intentions towards a NATO ally like somewhere in the Baltics. I mean, yeah. clearly if that message <coughs> isn't already understood, that's a dangerous situation. I mean, you're talking about an administration that uh, when presented with photographic evidence that Russian boots were on the ground in Ukraine, uh, stood there and denied uh, that Russia uh, had, US, had military uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I saw, according to one news report I saw, that the foreign minister suggested that maybe it was, uh, these were video game graphics that had been trumped up to try to frame the Russians. Uh, that sort of um, irrational explanation makes it hard to tell exactly what they're thinking. Right. Ed? Josh, um, as you were speaking, we heard Marine One leaving here so the President can go raise campaign money in Rhode Island and New York. And I wonder what you think about the optics of the President from that podium yesterday saying, he still does not have a strategy to deal with ISIS in Syria militarily. Uh, and the next day, without that strategy, goes out and raises campaign money. Well, the President did convene a meeting with his National Security Council uh, immediately after leaving this podium yesterday uh, to talk through with his uh, top national security advisors, including uh, top officials from the Pentagon, uh, about our more, more broad, comprehensive strategy against ISIL. That included a discussion. Uh, about the military options that are available to the President for dealing with ISIL in Syria. That's the responsibility of the Pentagon. There are dedicated professionals there uh, who are responsible and take seriously right, their so responsibility. He can go out and raise campaign money? Because I asked, because last week when he made the statement right after James Foley's beheading, uh, and within minutes was on the golf course, um, is he detached? Does he feel like the critics coming after him, it just doesn't matter anymore? Why is he still raising campaign money, playing golf, when he's acknowledging he doesn't have a strategy to deal with this. Well, Ed, the, uh, the job of any U.S. President is to be able to handle a lot of different responsibilities at the same time. Uh, that's why the President has a, a national security team in whom he has a lot of confidence. Uh, it is also why he, uh, you know, works closely with, with his advisors on a range of issues uh, to make sure that he is leading them in the right, right direction, that he is setting a vision for the future of this country. That's what allows him to handle a lot of responsibilities uh, at the same time. One of his responsibilities as the head, uh, as the, head of the party uh, is to support Democratic candidates who are on the ballot. And that's why the President is, uh, is also spending a little bit of time 
uh, supporting their efforts. But the President, there's no doubt, anybody who's looked at the President's schedule understands that he's devoting significant more time and energy to the more important responsibility that he has to ensure the safety and security of the American people. Okay, on the substance of his comments yesterday, so you today and the President yesterday are trying to make this broader argument that it was sort of the media, pundits, and others who were sort of suggested we were inching closer uh, to airstrikes against Syria. And, and I wonder if the President himself didn't help set that expectation on August 20th when he commented on James Foley's beheading and said, quote, this shocks the conscience of the entire world. Quote, when people harm Americans anywhere, we do what's necessary to see that justice is done. And we act, he said, we act against ISIS standing alongside others. Was that just an empty threat? No, Ed, as we've discussed, the President ordered military action in Iraq uh, in pursuit well, of... We've already been doing that before that statement, before the beheading. That's we were right. already that's, acting military in Iraq. That's right. And, and that's an indication of how serious the President said, takes this. We have this. to go into Syria if we're really going to take ISIS out. And so my question is, is there a way to get justice, as he said, told the American people in the world he was going to do, without military action in Syria? Uh, Ed, the President will get justice. Uh, the President promised that he will do that. How do you get to, is there a way to get justice without military action I'm trying to get at? Is it well, working with partners? Know, but, Ed, but we just talked about the fact that the President has already ordered military action in Syria. In Iraq. They've carried out Not in Syria. Uh, in, Syria. In, in Iraq. The President has ordered military action in Iraq uh, to go after ISIL elements that are threatening Americans. And we've talked about how substantial and important uh, those military actions have been uh, in support of protecting American citizens uh, in Iraq. Uh, so the President has not shying away at all, and he's already demonstrated that he's not going to shy away at all from using all of the elements of American power, whether it's military might uh, or diplomatic influence, uh, to represent American interests and to protect the lives of Americans in that region of the world. Yeah, two other quick ones to get beyond the, uh, the language of what he said, what he, what, what he meant. Uh, simple question. Why does he not have a strategy yet? Because the Pentagon, uh, is still developing military options for the President, for the Commander-in-Chief, uh, to use against ISIL in Syria. There are some who probably would make the case that it's okay to not have a formulated comprehensive strategy, but just as one pundit I know recently suggested, that we could just go drop some bombs and see what happens. Uh, that is not what the President believes is a smart approach. The President believes it's important for us to pursue a comprehensive strategy where military action is one component of that strategy. Does the Pentagon still not have a strategy? You're saying the Pentagon? It's the Pentagon's issue? They haven't put this strategy together yet? Is the Commander-in-Chief not saying, I want this plan on my desk tomorrow? Uh, what the President is saying is that he wants, he's going to be deliberate uh, about which components of our strategy can best be employed to protect the national security interests of the United States of America. He wants the Pentagon to be deliberate uh, as they develop the kinds of options uh, that may or may not be available to him. And the President will consider them, and he will act in a timely fashion as he uh, assesses uh, the best interest of the United States of America. In terms of a timely fashion, last one, uh, August 2013, a year ago this month, the President had a news conference here, and John Carl of ABC asked a question about whether the President still believes Al-Qaeda has been decimated. And the President said, core Al-Qaeda, as he said many times, has been decimated, but we're seeing these other groups meta uh, metastasizing into regional groups that can still be dangerous. And the President went on to say, he didn't name ISIS, but groups like ISIS, and said, quote, so that requires us then to make sure that we have a strategy that is strengthening those partners so that they've got their own capacity to deal with what are potentially manageable regional threats. August 2013, he's talking about how we need to be putting together a strategy. One year later, how could he not have that strategy? Uh, Ed, as we've talked about quite a bit, the President has been very explicit about what the comprehensive strategy is. Uh, that comprehensive strategy... You're saying that, but he said, I don't right. have that strategy specifically for Syria. But, Ed, what I'm trying to, if you'll let me uh, answer the question here. The, the point of that statement, and this is a, a, this is a sentiment, a strategy that the President has reiterated on a number of occasions. He reiterated this uh, at West Point when he spoke there on May 28th uh, of this year. Uh, he says, I believe that we must shift our counterterrorism strategy, drawing on the success and shortcomings of our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, to more effectively partner with countries where terrorist networks seek a foothold. Uh, he reiterated that strategy when he spoke uh, to the nation uh, over in the state dining room er earlier this month, where he talked about how the core component of our strategy needs to be building up regional partners so that the United States isn't, in a resp isn't responsible 
uh, for, in this situation, providing security for the people of Iraq. We need to build up our partners and make sure that we have a cooperative government so that the Iraqi people can provide for their own security. Uh, that is the way that we will find uh, an enduring way to deal with the threat that's posed by ISIL. If we rely only on America's military might, there's no question that because of the bravery and skill of our American uh, servicemen and women, that they can have a substantial impact on the battlefield, that they could, as the President said yesterday, route ISIL on the battlefield. There's no question about that. But if we want to make sure that ISIL doesn't come back, we need to make sure that we have effective partners who can provide for the security of their country and prevent ISIL from making a return. Now, there's a role for the United States to play, both diplomatically and even militarily, to support those efforts. Uh, but we're not going to be able to solve this problem for them. And I recognize that some of the President's critics don't agree. Some of the President's critics believe that the United States should act militarily, that we can go out and solve this problem for them. But that's going to require a substantial commitment of American military forces, an occupation of another country. Uh, and that's just not a strategy that the President believes succeeds. It certainly didn't succeed in Iraq last time around. Uh, and the President doesn't believe that's a recipe for success this time either. Okay? Kristen. Following up on the military options, you said that during the meeting yesterday the President discussed possible options with his national security team. So just to be clear on this point, has the Pentagon presented him with any military options at this point? Well, I, I'm not in a position to, as we've discussed a couple of times this week, I'm not going to get into a detailed play-by-play -play of the back and forth between the President and his senior military advisors. Uh, but I will tell you as a general matter uh, that the President uh, has been discussing with his national security team and with his senior team at the Pentagon. Uh, the range of options that are or may be available to him for countering ISIL options. militarily, uh, both in Iraq and in Syria. Options, uh, I will say that the President has discussed uh, with his national security team uh, some of the options that they're developing. I, I'm, I'm not going to, again, get into a play-by-play -play about whether or not they finalized their plans, whether or not the President has received them, whether or not he's reviewed them, whether he's gotten back to them about those finalized plans. I just. Uh, I, I'm not going to provide uh, that much insight into this uh, understandably private process. Uh, but I will tell you that the President is, uh, uh, has had a number of discussions with his national security team uh, about military options that may or may not be available to him. And going back to the discrepancy between the President's comments yesterday and Secretary Hagel, uh, Chairman Dempsey, last week, I know you're saying that they're on the same page right now, but does the President feel as though they got out ahead of him on this issue? Because they seem to be laying the groundwork for the strong possibility that there would be some type of military intervention in Syria. No, I continue to be confident, as I was earlier, that the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of Defense, and all the other senior members of the President's national security team uh, are on the same page as the Commander-in-Chief. And if you have any doubt about that, you should ask them. I, but I'm confident they'll tell you the same thing. Why the public discrepancy, Josh? Why do you have Secretary Hagel saying that this is a threat beyond anything that we've seen? What, why are we seeing this discrepancy in the public comments? Well, I, I think it's important to differentiate, though, between uh, a discrepancy about the policy and strategy that the President's pursuing uh, and uh, the different words that, Secretary, uh, uh, that the Secretary of Defense has chosen to describe this situation. He was offering up his honest assessment of what uh, he perceives based on his knowledge of what's happening on the ground. Uh, and I don't think it's particularly, uh, I don't think it's, not, it, the, the words that he used, he used, uh, you know, were different than, the, than what the President has said about this. Uh, but the policy implications of that for securing uh, the United States of America and our interests uh, are completely consistent. And if they're on the same page, does the President share that assessment that ISIS is beyond anything we've ever seen? Uh, the from the President was asked a couple of times yesterday about his assessment of ISIL and uh, the threat that they pose to the United States. So he's talked about this quite a bit. So I just refer you to his comments. And does he, in terms of the sense of urgency that he feels to come up with a strategy, I mean, obviously he's dispatched Secretary Kerry uh, to try to create a, an international coalition, does he have a timeline? Is this something that he's going to have a strategy within a matter of days, within a matter of weeks? Well, again, Kristen, he has laid out a comprehensive strategy for dealing with ISIL. Uh, it starts with the formation of an effective, inclusive Iraqi government. Uh, it includes stronger support and a stronger relationship uh, and a more effective uh, Iraqi and Kurdish security forces. Uh, it includes uh, greater engagement from regional governments who have a clear stake uh, in this outcome. Uh, it involves the participation of countries around the world uh, who uh, are concerned about the threat that's posed by ISIL. Uh, and it includes uh, the military actions that the President has already ordered uh, take place in Iraq uh, in support of all of those goals. So there are a range of components to the President's strategy. He's laid, out that, laid that out very clearly. 
Uh, and that's the strategy that we're going to pursue because the President believes it's in the best national security interest of the United States of America. It's also the only way we're going to get an enduring solution to this problem. And Josh, let me finally just get you to respond to something that the New York Times editorial board wrote yesterday. They wrote, quote, one problem is the administration's incomplete knowledge about ISIS or ISIL. Its numbers and organization, this is alarming given the billions of dollars spent since September 11, 2001 in developing technologies and strategies for detecting and assessing terrorist threats. Is that a fair assessment? Does the administration not have a complete sense of ISIL at this point in time? And why isn't there a better um, understanding of this group so many years after Well, September? for our assessment of ISIL's capabilities, I'd refer you to the intelligence community. Uh, but I can tell you that at the direction of the President, uh, every element of the President's national security team uh, is focused uh, on making sure that we are putting in place the kind of strategy and implementing and, uh, and executing on the strategy the President has laid out for protecting the national security interests of the United States. Peter. Josh, um, when the Ukrainian people hear you saying we're not trending toward uh, military action in Ukraine, and of course the comment that the President made ru flatly ruling that out, and when they see uh, constant threats of increased uh, notching up of sanctions, which again we're hearing about, uh, that have only seen Russia take more robust action uh, in their incursions, if that's what you want to describe it as, why shouldn't they think they're just their country's being written off? The people of Ukraine? Yeah. Uh, because the President also in his news conference said that the United States stands shoulder to shoulder with the people of Ukraine. I believe that was the phrase that he used. Uh, that's a pretty strong signal of support uh, from the United States, the one indispensable nation in the world, uh, in support of their cause. Uh, you've also seen the United States acting in concert with our allies impose significant costs on Russia for Russia's strategy in Ukraine. Uh, and those economic costs have taken a toll on the Russian economy. We've seen significant capital flight from Russia. There's a pretty clear indication uh, that Russia uh, is not a really that, that, the, that the global investing public uh, doesn't think that Russia is a pretty good place to park your money right now. Uh, in fact, there are units rolling all through uh, Ukraine now, too. Uh, they do. It has but no effect. They also, uh, well, again, the sanctions have had an effect. They have taken a toll on their economy. Capital flight, uh, we've seen the uh, Russian uh, currency weakened so much that the central bank has expended significant sums of money to try to prop up the value of that currency. Uh, we have seen uh, economic projections as it relates to e economic growth in Russia significantly curtailed. Uh, we have seen uh, Russia's credit rating downgraded by independent credit rating organizations. So there has been a toll that has been taken on the Russian economy. Uh, and ultimately it will be up to President Putin uh, to determine exactly uh, how he wants to respond to this situation. But uh, the fact is, and the President said this yesterday too, that for all of Russia's continued agitation in Ukraine, Russia is becoming only more isolated uh, and more weakened. Do you see that though having any effect on its military uh, actions in Ukraine? No. Well, what we have seen is we have seen the Russians continue their efforts uh, to transfer weapons and material and even personnel uh, across the border from Russia into Ukraine. Uh, but ultimately, those, those sorts of decisions are made by President Putin. But there is a significant cost associated with those, with those decisions. We have seen that the, the impact it has taken on the Russian economy. We have seen Russia become more isolated. And the, in the President's view, uh, Russia is weaker as a result. Uh, and so President Putin needs to make a decision about whether or not he wants, he's willing to significantly weaken his country just to, to destabilize uh, a country that's on their border. What do you think Putin's up to today with comments like uh, reminding a, a young audience of, of Russia's uh, nuclear capability? Well, as I mentioned, I think, in answer to Stephen's question, that when they're uh, denying uh, photographic evidence uh, of Russia's military actions in Ukraine, it's, it's pretty hard to tell what exactly they're thinking over there. Okay. Zeke, I'll give you the last one, then we'll do the week ahead. Hey, Go ahead, Zeke. <laughs> so is it your assessment that, uh, or the administration's assessment that a threat level facing the United States from ISIS, ISIL, is lower than that in Britain, and that's the reason why the threat level hasn't been elevated? Well, uh, I, I wouldn't draw that clear of a line. I, th I think what I would do is I would say, uh, you know, the President's been clear about the threat that ISIL does pose in the form of these foreign fighters uh, to the United States and our interests. That's something that we're concerned about, focused on, and actively working to mitigate. Uh, and uh, we don't at this point, however, uh, see a reason to change the, the threat level in this country. Uh, but I, again, I, for an official assessment of that, though, I'd refer you to the, the Department of Homeland Security that's responsible for making those decisions. On that, I mean, in terms of the, you, you said before you didn't anticipate a change in the threat level, and just said that, re, re, repeated that now. What, what would change that assessment? What is the trigger that the, that the President and his administration would look for? 
Well, it would be the responsibility of the Secretary of Homeland Security to make that determination. Uh, and so what factors would play into that, I'd refer you to the Secretary of Homeland Security. Okay. So with that, why don't we do a quick week ahead and then we'll call it a day. The President, as we all know, will be departing here uh, tomorrow evening uh, with his family to go to New York uh, to participate in a private event, to attend a private event uh, in New York. Uh, on Monday, the President is looking forward to celebrating Labor Day in Milwaukee. Uh, he'll be traveling there for an event where he'll deliver remarks. Uh, on Tuesday morning, the President will depart the White House uh, for his uh, trip to Europe. Uh, he will travel to Estonia. Uh, he'll spend the night, Tuesday night in Estonia. He'll do a range of uh, meetings with uh, the leaders of the Baltic nations in, uh, in Estonia before leaving Estonia on Wednesday night to travel to Wales for the NATO summit. Uh, the NATO summit will take place uh, Thursday and Friday, uh, and the President will t return on uh, Friday evening back here to the White House. Uh, over the course of that trip, I do anticipate you'll have a couple of opportunities uh, to hear directly from the President and even ask him a question or two. All right. Thanks, everybody. Talon and uh, Wales. I'm sorry? Presser and Talon and Wales. Uh, that's the current plan, yes. Okay. Have a good Labor Day weekend, everybody.